So in 1943, some years ago, Thomas Watson said a really interesting sentence. Uh, and if you don't know him, he was the founder of IBM. And what he said back then is, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. And look at us now. Yeah, and I think that's a really great example of the cyclical nature of technology in general. Why are we talking about the cyclical nature uh, and expectations management in tech? Well, I think everyone might have heard about the thing called AI hype that could be happening right now around the world. Um, and I actually love this Gartner graph because it really highlights that what we're feeling are, uh, around the world, that the hype cycle is very strong at the moment. It is very much happening. Um, but as technology professionals, we also know that that is not the, the only truth so, so to say. We know that, okay, soon, likely, it's going to go down and, you know, the slope of entitlement became and then actually we will get to the plateau of productivity when kind of the hype disperses. But we can actually see the benefits of the technology in the long run, long run and so forth. But mostly this is just to set the scene that um, I think we know that the technology behind these things, innovations, is quite nice and um, we can really utilize them. But um, very happy to welcome you to On Offer You Can't Refuse, uh, discovering Chicago film sets with Amalops and Kubernetes. I'm Annie Tavasto, uh, I'm CMO at Vision, which is a Swiss DevOps company, and I'm also a CNCF ambassador as well as an Azure MVP. I also have done such things like Cloud Cosy Podcast, Cloud Native Live hosting for a couple of years and so forth. So a lot of fun stuff. I'm very excited to be talking to you here today. Fantastic. Great to have you with me today. Uh, so hi, I am Adi Polak. I'm the author of Scaling Machine Learning, where I'm diving into different topologies of how you can do distributed compute, starting with Spark and progressing into TensorFlow and PyTorch distributed approaches. Uh, and I'm also a Databricks ambassador, which means I'm working extensively with the open source community, such as Spark, MLOps, uh, um, Delta Lake, and so on. Perfect. Uh, so a bit about our agenda today. We have about 30-ish minutes, so we're going to be quite quick. So we have introduction, which is happening right now. Then we have some best practices. Then we have a quick demo. Then we have the open source stack that you can use to do all of these things that we're talking about. Uh, and then we have some learn more resources in the end. So um, very much, I think we're going to have a fun ride today. Um, to set ourselves up, I think we can kind of agree that MLOps loves Kubernetes as a whole uh, because uh, AI really requires a lot of the things that Kubernetes can offer. So it really requires portability, customizability, performance, consistency, microservices, composability, and security. So Kubernetes offers a great platform, a great orchestration tool to manage MLOps and AI in production, which is also the reason why we are here talking about Kubernetes and MLOps together. But how does that journey look like then uh, from that side? Yes, so according to 2019 research, 70% out of all the work that researchers are doing to develop machine learning models never got to production. And that's because a lot of them were under, uh, they didn't get enough budget, uh, they didn't have enough support from the teams, and these things are starting to change. According to the recent research from the last year, we're already seeing that only 50% of the actual models that are being developed don't get to production, which means 50% actually gets to production. And that shows that there is a market, there is a need, and we finally understand what are the benef benefits that machine learning can do for us as an industry. And so our question shifted, not, not from how do I develop the best model, that's always a big question, but actually how do I enable the machine learning folks, the machine learning researchers, data science, and so on, to get their models into production. And what we're seeing now that our stack is, has expanded. We used to have as developers, as practitioners, we used to have our dev environment, our staging environment, our production environment. And now many companies are adding another environment. That's the experiment environment. That's not the AB, AB that we're all used to, but it's kind of similar in a way that we need to give researchers a place that they can run their experiment and scale from four cores that they usually start with to thousands and thousands of machine looking into distributed training uh, as we go. And those environments are extremely hard to develop because challenges like hardware compatibility, the different model, image size, and so on that we're going to dive into them today. Perfect. 
Uh, then the title and the description did have movies uh, in, in the description, so why that, how come? Uh, so Chicago actually is historically very well known as a film city. So back in the day, actually, over 80% of film production or film makers um, of the movies were produced in the US. So over 80% of them was done in Chicago. So historically very strong movie city. And even nowadays, Chicago ranks among uh, the top hubs for movie making. So obviously Hollywood is quite big as well, uh, but Chicago is out there with the other hubs as well. Uh, just as an example, there's only one studio, for example, that has over 36 stages, spread over 1.6 million square uh, foot feet of studio uh, around uh, the city. So that is very much kind of like a st testament to the movie making capabilities of the city. Um, which is why we have selected to talk about movies in this particular KubeCon. Uh, now, some of the famous movies filmed in Chicago that you might know or you might not know, depending on, on how deep you are in the topic. Uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, for example. Transformers 3 and 4, exciting. Uh, then we have Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, Batman vs. Superman, The Batman. So a lot of Batman movies, for example, have been actually filmed here which is actually exactly why, but now that we're gonna be running through the six and some extra ones, uh, best practices for MLOps, uh, it's going to be the special edition Batman. Um, so very happy to go through these six and some extra with you today. So we're gonna kick off with collaboration. Yeah, I love that edition. There's always a big conversation about DC versus Marvel, but today we're all leaning into the DC space, so that's, that's fine. Um, okay, so the first one is collaboration, and collaboration speaks about systems of people, right? It's how do we find the language to communicate and converse what it is that we need with different parts of the organization. So a lot of the challenges is how do we develop with customer in mind, knowing that now maybe one of our customers is a researcher. Uh, they care mostly about papers, they want to get a high uh, age index, and we need to build a system that is good for them so they can build state-of-the-art machine learning, and later on we can push it to production relatively fast. So we're changing a little bit the way we're thinking about the world and the system that we build, and we also know that now we need to have kind of a shared language, uh, with, and with the boom of LLMs, all of us are kind of learning what everything means, what are tokens, how are they different, why is it bytes and tokens and uh, data entries uh, and so on. So this is really the first piece uh, that we need to tackle is the collaboration and finding a shared language within the organization. Exactly. And uh, if sometimes people might say that developers or data scientists might be a bit of a lone wolf, so can definitely Batman be. But as such as Batman, uh, developers do also have to learn to collaborate. For example, as Batman and the others did in Batman versus Superman. So you do have to kind of learn these skills to slay all the monsters that are attacking you so that you can team up and become uh, the superhero or the MLOps uh, team of your dreams, for sure. Uh, but more best practices, version control, and model management. Yeah, just one sentence about Batman that I want everyone to understand. So Batman is the ultimate solopreneur, right? When we think about Batman, he develops his own ships, his own cars, his own things. But even Batman knows that if you run alone, you can run fast. But if you run together, you run far. So this is something to bear in mind that even our greatest heroes understand. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, so the second practice is something that we see very often, we most familiar with that. We need a place to have a version control, but now we're adding another layer of model management. I need to version my models themselves. I need to manage them. I need to know where are they in my life cycle of development. Are they only an experiment? Do we need to scale them? What are the hyperparameters? What are the variations of distributed settings that they need? What is the uh, GPUs that I'm running on top of them? Because I might need that for inferencing as well. Inferencing is when I'm deploying my model to production and serving my customers user using that. So there's a lot of aspects around version control and model management that we need to add into organizations in order to take it to the next step. Exactly, so for example, tools like MLflow or Kubeflow can really help with model versioning. And uh, version control is something that Batman has had to learn the hard way as well, because there's so many versions of it. So you have the Michael Keaton version, you have the, the, uh, the Pattison version, and so many others. And even there, you really do have to do a lot of version control, because uh, these, all of these different versions have different costumes as well as different mannerisms and so forth. So they need to have um, distinctive features. Yeah. 
the next up we have automated testing and CI/CD. Uh, so really, this is super important um, because it really benefits the code, uh, ensuring that the code reali re reliability, efficient deployment, and continuous improvement is top notch. So CI/CD pipelines automate um, the integration, testing, and deployment processes, and reduce the manual intervention and accelerating the, the delivery of reliable models to production then down the road there. Yeah, and this is really critical as we're building a feedback loop, right? The CICD want to be able to be as close to production as much as possible. So again, bringing fresh data uh, and real production use case is going to help us a lot in figuring out if that model actually makes sense. Uh, and we'll touch a, a little bit about that, about feedback loop and how it's kind of like a place where we don't know how to measure our model, especially with LLMs now, uh, because it's, we don't know if that text is being generated as high quality enough or not, essentially. Exactly. Um, and I think another good point that Batman has made about automated testing or like tool that we know that Batman uses it is as well, but we can see Alfred is part of this maybe. So there he says, can I persuade you to take a sandwich, sir? So he really helps in the background. He helps Batman with his food needs or with, for example, he's, um, for example, testing his equipment, making sure all these things are happening and it all is happening quite automated and uh, really easily and independently from the needs of Batman, which is a test to the uh, importance of automated testing, for example. Yeah, so then we have containerization as the next best practice. Yes, so for a long, long time now, we, most of us, used to use either uh, VMs or Docker, leaning in between the two, and there are different tools. Some of the challenges that we see here is now, if we want to uh, containerize everything together with our model, we're looking at images of about 60 gigabyte. And that could be really, really big, uh, especially if we need to download it and if we need to do auto-scaling. So now we're changing things a little bit. It might be that during time when my pod is going up, I might start downloading it in, uh, in buffer mode, and there are some different open source tools to enable me to download uh, my model in, in buffer mode. Um, and there's also a question about the hardware. So VMs are usually faster because we're, it's, we don't have another layer there with, that we have with Docker. So those usually get better throughput from the network, but then it means that we need to program our image and program everything that we do to fit a specific VM in a specific operation system where it runs, uh, where Docker kind of makes our, our life much easier. So here we're facing a big challenge, especially with inferencing, when we need to scale up, okay, or, or horizontally, and we need to create more pods on the fly to serve more customers, but how do we containerize that LLM model in order to be able to scale relatively fast? Uh, and we have another bullet point about scaling, but I want, I want you to think about it, because this is another real bottleneck that we're seeing in the industry. Uh, and it seems like only big companies found a solution, and some companies are actually leaning into renting their own servers again. So it's kind of like what we've seen 10 years ago about cloud versus on-prem. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting discussion that happens now and each company develops different solution based on their budgets and resources. Exactly, and also Batman is an expert in containerization because he has the Batmobile and he can you know, use it to uh, isolate himself from the world around him. So he can even be protected from explosions, lava pits, everything around him. Um, and I hope that your dev environments are not as dangerous as the explosions and the lava pits in Batman's life, but they could be as stressful, but hopefully not as dangerous at least. But there is also monitoring, logging, security, and documentation, which is a lot of it in the one best practice, but we'll try. <laughs> yes, uh, we'll definitely try. So who here handled security for containers and scaling up and SQL injection, DOS, DDoS? Okay, okay couple cool. People. I see a couple of folks. Great. So history kind of repeats itself, only on a different flavor. Uh, so what we're seeing here is things are very similar to uh, SQL injection, where we can put any string that we want, and essentially we're sending it to our servers, and those servers are going to give us the information back. Uh, and we're because it's very similar to prompt injection, where we're sending essentially a string, right, to the server, then history kind of repeats itself, and it's a good opening for prompt injection, different things like XSS, opening a shell, right? Opening a shell with the actual uh, server so we can do whatever we want. Um, all the traditional network attack, OpenAI just announced that they're rec uh, they've seen patterns of DDoS attack in their network. This is why they've been down since yesterday. Um, 
And that makes it really, really hard for us when we think about how do we want to containerize our model and how do we want to create also a sandbox for that already heavy model that we need to serve in order to make sure we are protecting our customers' data and we're protecting ourselves from all of these uh, attacks. Um, and it also correlates to the feedback loop because I want to know my model is okay, so how do I distinguish between what was an actual prompt injection attack or what was an actual kind of a bad prompt that got into the system because my user is not educated enough and my feedback loop returned an answer that it wasn't supposed to return and maybe I need to retrain my model again. So we're entering this phase where we need to have gateway for our AI that it's a little bit more sophisticated, something that is similar to WAF, web, web application firewall, where we have filters of what is going in, what is, what is going out. Uh, which add another layer of complexity because of the nature of how these models uh, behave that, again, we can put it in a strategy and target it when we need to, but we should be aware of that as well. Yeah, and um, Batman is also a bit of a security fanatic. I think a lot of you probably know that. Uh, so he really does monitor Gottman with, for example, all of these screens that he has in his Batcave. Um, so he is really focused on monitoring, as you can see from the amount of screens there. Um, and he's really focused on logging it all, as well as using that for security. But obviously, he might be keeping illegal recordings of all the people of Gotham, which is not maybe a best practice that you should be following. Um, so don't do everything that Batman does, but uh, something to consider, yeah. Who know, the next Biden administration will <laughs> bring something new. Yeah, so the next up we have scalability. Yes, scalability is a really interesting topic. So if we go back to the slide where we look at the different environments, right, from the experiment all the way to all the way to production, then we see different places where we need to scale our clusters. Uh, from experiment, we need to go to distributed training topologies where we need to configure all the hardware, configure how we're distributing, configure MPI, and uh, a lot of different things depending on what it is that we want to achieve. And the goal here is really to abstract all these from the researchers. So they won't need to deal with all the ops underneath. Uh, they'll only need to deal with you know, how the data looks like and what's the best model uh, to use here. So that's a really big uh, challenge now, how to abstract all of these things. Uh, second thing is inferencing. We're actually in production and we're serving the model. Are we serving the model in batch or are we serving the model in streaming? If we go into batch, maybe we can have some prediction around what is happening uh, with the amount of requests that we get. Uh, we, have, we have some previous knowledge of what, what's going on. But if we're thinking about streaming, if we're building a solution such as serverless or SaaS or anything like that, then the predicting how to uh, grow uh, how to scale my cluster becomes really hard because it could be that adding just another not node, another pod, could take something like an hour, right? And so looking at the SLAs, understanding when to auto scale, understanding what to do with streaming is a different, it's completely different use case than what we're doing in batching, which is a little bit more uh, predictable. Uh, and also, we need to add layers such as caching. That is another big question. It's like, how do I do multi-tenancy right, for a specific customer? If I have a customer profile, that means my LLM is slightly different. So how do I know how to cut the base LLM? Right? We have the network. How do I cut the base LLM and keep the edges just for the customer? So that's another question that uh, the open source uh, world is trying to answer. Um, and for autoscaling specifically, there's a really cool project named Keda. Uh, I know probably most of you have fami are familiar with that. It's a CNCF project that enables us to autoscale based on queues. So instead of looking at CPU cycle or GPU cycles, now I'm looking into queues and I can configure it to look at specific things that are relevant for my LLM or for my machine learning, uh, that it's not based on the specific cycles of a machine. Uh, so a lot of open questions in that space and very specific uh, use cases. Yeah, exactly. But uh, Kata just relatively recently graduated as well, so that is a very nice for them. Congrats. Um, but Batman knows, as the last Batman tip of the day, uh, Batman knows something about scalability as well, at least in here, where he is actually using his Batman label literally to extend his body and legs and arms by becoming a mecha robot, which is one way to do scalability, um, but it is scaling his body literally, so that's very nice. Um, but then, moving on to best practice uh, rapid fire. So there was a few tips that are kind of more condensed here than the big ones 
that we had dedicated there. So MLOps loves DevOps. So if there's any DevOps or Kubernetes cloud native professionals here who are wondering, okay, should I be starting to focus on MLOps? Is it something where I should be exploring more? And that has been a, maybe a key theme across this uh, KubeCon as well on we need more uh, kind of resources or ideas from the cloud native scene towards MLOps to solve a lot of the challenges that Adi has been, for example, mentioning here. So while we do that transition, I think we have to keep in mind that all of the DevOps practices that we have learned and loved uh, within our previous work, those all usually apply. Like obviously there's a lot of things that you need to learn in top of with MLOps space, but don't, let's not forget all the good DevOps tips and tricks that we have learned uh, that help our lives. Understanding the bottlenecks is also super important. So uh, really kind of digging deep into, okay, where are in that long road from research to production that I kind of mentioned in the beginning, where are the actual bottlenecks in the organization? Is it, for example, in the self-service models for data scientists, or is it when you're taking actually things into production and so forth? So there's a lot of spots that you can kind of look out for. Uh, up-leveling your skills, so if you are doing a transition from a certain area to another one, obviously focusing on learning the skills that you need to master to get there uh, be uh, better there. So if you are, for example, a uh, cloud native KubeCon, like a Kubernetes person, then it might be worth looking into Python, math, and basics of data scientist, uh, and vice versa if you are more from the data scientist side and trying to get into MLOps, then it might be worthwhile to learn a bit more about cloud services and cloud native and so forth. Um, uh, last but definitely this time, definitely not the least, it's all in the data for all of these things because if you put bad data in, you're never going to get good results. So talking about the data of our presentation today, so we have the Chicago Data Portal filming permits from the transportation department. That is a bit of a mouthful, but essentially this is data, open data from the city of Chicago that is about how many filming permits, what kind of filming permits does the city give out. Um, the data is there, but we're gonna do a quick run through of, of general parts of the data as well, but anyone can dive deep on their own time as well. Me as a movie uh, fan, a geek, I love this data so much. It's a lot of fun. Um, and also, obviously, there's a lot of different things that you can discover from there. So just like a quick tidbit there. So as you can see, the data set here, uh, just a few days ago, I took screenshots because I didn't want to trust the internet too much to be fast. It's always a bit tricky. Um, so we have, for example, or 40,000 views, downloads, and so forth. It's, uh, the data goes from all the way from 2015 to current. So unfortunately, for example, you cannot see the filming permit for Ferris Bueller's day off or so forth. But it still has a good amount of uh, data there. Um, it has columns such as you know application number, application type, work type, application status, and so forth. So there's a lot of things there. Uh, this is how it looks like if you start like opening up the, the rows. So you can see there, if you can see, well, it's quite big. Um, so you see current milestones, application start date, application process date, name, comments. Um, and you see here, for example, that there's a prom, doing some filming for their high school prom, which is kind of cute in my opinion, that's very nice. And there's a lot of student films being uh, recorded and so forth. But there is a lot of exciting ones if you kind of look through it, there's a lot of things you know. Um, some movie filming and, and inter filming and so forth. And if we go here, I think this one has, yes, so we have the NFL end zone is doing some filming here. So if anyone's a hockey fan, you know where to go on that date then. Uh, don't disturb any film sets, obviously, but, but you know where they would be. Um, so there's a lot of interesting facts here. You get obviously the address, exact address, what are they doing, even more usually data on what are they actually doing, what kind of camera sets are they using, or even uh, the um, like primary addresses of the people who are asking the data and so forth. But uh, there's a lot of fun stuff. Adi, you would want to talk a bit more about it. Yeah, so I always say uh, when you do uh, BI or kind of data analytics, uh, you can shake the data as much as you want to confirm that what it is that you want to see. Uh, so just bear that in mind when, when we're doing that. But some of the thing, interesting things that we wanted to know is which street are probably going to have film location the most. Uh, and so we looked at which uh, street uh, requests the most permits, which one get accepted. So you can see here that uh, Clark Street, um, Wabash Street, Walker Street, uh, and a bunch of other them, uh, other of them get the, and the one that gets the least request is Portland, but it still gets requests, so it's more than the one that don't get anything. 
Uh, and of course, we kind of did some diving in. And then we asked ourselves, okay, so which month should I go to this street to find a film location? And we discovered that March 2023 was the most crowded in terms of request applications. Uh, so definitely if you're a movie fan, if you're a Batman fan, if you know there is a, a movie coming up and they're now filming, you need to go to uh, Wabas Street on March uh, next year, and then we can we, we put it on a map to see how it looks like, uh, what's the distance, if we need to run from place to place as well, so we can better plan our next visit uh, to the city. Um, all right, should we go for the demo? Yeah. There we go. All right, so I talked about all the challenges we had with uh, Kubernetes, and one of the biggest challenges that uh, Annie and I had was actually getting uh, GPU pools. Apparently, those are scarce, and you need to book them in advance and have a very big uh, company logo attached to them or work for the biggest big clouds. So the second best that we did, and again, to demonstrate what it is that you can do, is we actually took uh, pre-configured uh, LLMs uh, and we fine tune them. So here in Azure, what you can do, you can create your own deployment. Uh, and so I created my own deployment. I took uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo and I added it. I fine tuned it with some data that I put here inside. So you can see this is the Chicago Q&A uh, JSON L uh, lines uh, that we added. And I call my model Annie because I can. <laughs> um, all right, and now that I have my model fine-tuned, I didn't need to deal with any GPUs, lucky me. Um, I wanted to start experimenting, running some things against that to see what I get back. Uh, and so I started building instructions. Sometimes you'll see things like uh, prompt that it's more of a template size. You have, you tell the model exactly what it is that it's supposed to do. This is how you kind of focus it into the right direction. So you have examples, you have the questions that you want to put, and you want to add a response. Now this oftentimes works, and this is where you can add like hard-coded rules to your model um, in order to make sure it doesn't expose any specific data or it answers to some specific request or even if you want to change specific terminology that the user puts because the user might not be extremely familiar with your product terminology and you want to switch it to something that exists, for example, within your docs uh, and so on, this is possible. So we can do all of that, but then we decided to just play with the prompt specifically uh, for the case uh, of this demo. So here I have some input that I'm getting from a user. Is there any permits with application start date November 23? And you can see there that the, the way we, we structured the sentence was specifically to fit the data that we gave the algorithm. So application start date. This is a column in my data. And it was really important because otherwise the model didn't respond well. Uh, so something to bear in mind. And we're doing just an HTTPS request to Azure uh, using the OpenAI uh, on Azure. So we're sending that request, we're packaging it, uh, we're sending it over, and then we're getting some response. Uh, and the response is interesting, but uh, it says, yes, there is a permit when an application start date in November, but it also says that the permit with a specific number here, 1850015, um, has an application start date of August 28. So you can see my model hallucinated a little bit, although I played really, really hard with telling it what to do. Uh, and this means that we still have a lot of work to do around fine tuning, around prompt engineering, around uh, working out uh, with our data to make things work. Um, yeah, and so my Batman is traveling in Chicago, and uh, hopefully we'll find him soon, but this is just the beginning. We'll still need to do a lot of work to reach a model that actually works for our needs, either if they're internals or their external needs. Uh, so the whole process around productionizing, fine tuning, adding observability, the feedback loop, the quality assurance uh, is really, really critical. Uh, and by the way, for quality assurance, uh, there are some known ways to go about that. There's the rouge and there's the blue from uh, uh, Hugging Face uh, that helps you assure that the actual generated text, text makes sense. Uh, and one of them is actually uh, adding a human in the loop. So having a dedicated person that looks at the response and say, okay, that makes sense or it doesn't was really, really critical uh, for that. Good. 
Uh, but when he's traveling, actually, from the venue to the filming location as well, so that's, that's <laughs> okay. useful. Um, that's important. Yes, and then let's switch this a bit. Yes, curve, perfect. Ah, so that was the demo quickly there. So then open source stack for LLMs that we would kind of recommend you to look into is uh, obviously thinking about things such as secure GPU pools and hardware, you need to do get that. Open source models, obviously. So Llama, Dolly, Claude, MPT, Falcon, and so forth would be at the top of the list. And Hugging Face, for example, lets you explore all of these. Uh, LLM starter pack that was um, pitched or mentioned by Priyanka in the keynote this week was a really great place to start with and start playing around with. Highly recommend that. Um, you do need a specific hardware for that, so just make sure you're, if you're going for this, make sure you have the, the hardware that is needed. Yeah, so Hugging Phase, I also mentioned that already quickly there. Uh, really good stuff, and there has been a few good demos of Hugging Phase within this Cube and KubeCon as well, so um, I recommend checking in that those as well, and Langchain, as well as Kubeflow, Airflow, and MLflow um, for uh, good running there as well. So, uh, and data obviously is needed as well, and make sure that that works really well. But then, what is actually Kubeflow that I've kind of mentioned a few times within this presentation already? Um, probably all, many of you have heard about it, but if you have not, so Kubeflow is an open source platform that's designed to make it easier to deploy, manage, and scale machine learning workloads on Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, and it provides a set of tools, frameworks, uh, and best practices to really streamline the development and deployment of those machine learning models. So it is really an end-to-end -end ML workflow, so it really helps you cover the entire machine learning workflow from data pre-processing to model training uh, to deployment and monitoring. And it also helps with scalability and resource management. Uh, so you can le really leverage Kubernetes' orchestration capabilities for easy scaling um, of machine learning workloads um, and really dynamically add, allocate resources then. And it really helps with reproducibility and collaboration as well. And uh, collaboration was, has also been a topic at hand throughout this presentation, all, also in the Batman tips. So that's also why this is really important. Um, so it really helps you with capturing metadata, uh, environment details, and code versions associated with each, each yeah. experiment as well. Yeah, when you think about building the control plane, it helps you manage a lot of the, the metrics underneath to get combined with MLflow that gives you another layer of managing your models themselves. Exactly, so for example, if your bottleneck is around, for example, having a self-service model for a data scientists in your organization, that really helps them boost their productivity, Qflow is a great resource for that. But here are some learn more resources. So uh, obviously the link and slides, you can also find them in Sked as well. Uh, but I've added them to GitHub as well. Um, there's the data link there that if you want to check that out, it's a lot of fun to play around with that. There's the practical MLOps book if you want to get more hands on like, okay, this is how you get started in Azure, AWS, or so forth on MLOps. Highly recommend that O'Reilly book there. There's Adi's book there that, that she has written uh, about scaling machine learning. And then um, I did a session in KCD Washington DC, more focused on kind of like the overall, okay, how does Kubernetes fit into the MLOps world and so forth, so if you want to tune in there. And then there's also a bit more resources there on Kubeflow for machine learning as well. Now, what have we actually gone through here today? It's been a tight 30 minutes. We've learned about collaboration, version control, automated testing, containerization, and monitoring, logging, and so forth, and scalability. And we've learned that be like Batman was the theme of the beginning of the presentation. But remember that don't always be like Batman because we are really living in the real world. But thank you so much. And I think we have a bit of time for Q&A now, um, but we'll also be here obviously after the session. So you can come and talk to us afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.